You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Advisor's, advisor's option. option, the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop options strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end -end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the, the Advisor's, Advisor's Option. option. All right, everybody. That music means it is that time of month, listeners. Yes, it is time once again for the Advisors Option, the program here on the old Options Insider Radio Network. For you, the busy financial advisor and asset manager out there, we get it. You're busy dealing with your clients probably a lot these days, <laughs> given what we're seeing in the markets right now. You don't have time to keep up with the latest developments in the world of options. We know from talking to a lot of you that you all want a little bit more options education. So we're here to help you with that and a whole bunch more. My name is Mark Longo from the aforementioned network, as well as, of course, from the ever compelling theoptionsinsider.com, the place to go to get a lot of Matt's and his team's latest Earnings news, earnings move results, earnings season, earnings trades, a whole bunch of great reports and a whole bunch more. Because you like you folks, it's all there for free. Theoptionsinsider.com is the place to go. And let's see who's joining me on the old program today. I just mentioned his reports. So you know I'm joined once again by my compatriot in all things advisors, Option Crime, the founder and principal over there at ORATS, a.k.a. Options Research and Technology of Services. Easy for me to say, a.k.a. the Oracle of New Hampshire himself, Mr. Matt Amberson. Matt, welcome back to the Advisors Options, sir. I'm sorry we had such a quiet and boring month with nothing to talk about for you, sir. Yeah, and, you know, I was on vacation and listening uh, to the Option Insider on the beach, and your voice sounds so much slower right now. I mean, I to it, <laughs> you do, 2X, you so do like I, 3X, I mean, right? Used to this. <laughs> Probably sound like a chipmunk to you. I find our content is very conducive to a little bit of a day on the beach. 
it's, it's nice stuff to keep you engaged while the sand and the waves are washing over you. And also joining us today here on the old Advisors Option Program, a newcomer to the Advisors Option Program, Mr. Rick Rosenthal, the Director of Business Development over there at the SIBO. Rick, welcome to the Advisors Option Program. Thank you very much, Mark. You know, it's a pleasure to be here, even though in Chicago it is uh, not warm. It is sunny, and uh, it's just a, a delightful uh, experience to be on your program. Well, you have been on TWIFO one or two times in the past, talking about all things Russell 2000. Like I mentioned, this is your first appearance on the Advisors Option. A little bit of a different audience for this program. So let's start there, Rick. Why don't you give our Advisors Options audience a little bit of an overview of what your background is in the derivative space, as well as what it is you do day to day over there at the CBO? Sure. I've been in the industry for about 40 years. Uh, for those who have seen the movie Trading Places, I was on the floor at the Merck, the Board of Trade, SIBO, in the heyday, uh, 80s and 90s, when the markets were robust. We had a, a vibrant floor. Um, my role was an institutional broker. I was running a, a desk for Cargill and then Dean Witter. And our clients were primarily hedge funds, pensions, endowments, foundations, mutual fund managers, uh, Etc. So I had the privilege of working with some of the biggest and most experienced managers in the world, uh, trading on behalf of the, uh, as an agent, on behalf of the clients, futures, options, ETS, etc. I joined CBO in 2015 with the responsibility of focusing on business development within the FTSE Russell product line and have since transformed into business development within the investment advisory space. So I'm very happy to be on your program today and talking about how options can be used to manage risk and generate income. And really quick, Rick, you mentioned you kind of focus on the advisory space in addition to, of course, our old friends over there and FTSE, Russell, Lamp. Some people may be wondering, why SIBO on an advisor show? What is SIBO bringing to the table for the advisor audience? I know you guys have a few products, a few indices that may intrigue them. Give us a quick rundown at the top of the show here, Rick. Sure. So the investment advisor space is interesting because uh, there's over 300,000 investment advisor representatives, like reps, and the vast majority do not use options, let's say 30% or less. And the, the reason for that is primarily the lack of education. And so SIBO uh, has a mandate to try to get uh, advisors to become more comfortable, more aware of the benefits of using options-based strategies. So our role here is to provide that education. I'm not selling any product. I'm not selling anything. Uh, but what I want to do is help advisors get comfortable with the subject matter, understand even though these are considered derivatives uh, and what comes with derivatives, leverage and risk, using well-designed options-based strategies are very effective in managing risk and generating income and enhancing the risk-adjusted returns on a portfolio. So SIBO has created a number of uh, indexes measuring the hypothetical performance of various strategies. We've got tools, we've got so let's go. All right. Let's go indeed right on into the PL statement. Earnings announcements can move markets, but what is the options market telling us about upcoming earnings events? Let's find out with the Earnings Volatility Report. All right, everybody. Welcome to the PL statement. The statement that was born during the height of the pandemic because we kept coming back to this show every month and we found ourselves spending so much time breaking down what the heck just happened. What did we just see? What unprecedented things unfolded in the world or options or volatility since our last show. It got so frequent that we decided we had to make a segment out of it. And it's a good thing we did because this month would certainly qualify in a lot of respects. Matt, let's start with you here, sir. I was obviously joking at the top of the show. Uh, we have seen yet again, January once again coming roaring in like a lion, seeing things 
not quite unprecedented this January, but certainly things we have not seen in quite some time. So walk us through. I know a lot of our listeners uh, are excited. They want to hear what you had to say, Matt, especially last week, you know, coming into last Monday, you fire up your screens, you turn on your machines, you see we're down four plus, I think it was four and a quarter percent at one point in the NASDAQ, over a thousand points in the Dow. And then we see this Epic mother of all reversals. Of course, vol spikes to about 38 and change in the VIX before coming off. We see a similar thing play out the next day. Not quite as extreme, 2 plus percent, but then reversing all of that. Later in the week, we see a strong rally. That gets reversed as well. It's just a week of epic comebacks, epic reversals. Matt, walk us through what's been lighting up your tape since the last time we chatted, sir. Yeah, so thanks, Mark. It's been uh, been quite a month, and... You know, at the beginning of the last month, we had just started to see, you know, we wa- I watched these indicators, you know, implied volatilities, uh, but then uh, forward volatilities. And um, and what we started to see was those relationships break down. So one of the things I like to, to look at is, you know, a forward volatility re- relationship. So that's something where um, you, you might look at a 30-day uh, implied volatility, constant maturity that people like to talk about, and then a 90-day. And, and then let's say, the you know, right now, we're, we are getting right about flat. Our contango is about zero. So, you know, it might be a 30 and a 30, and, of course, in between the 30 and the 90-day is 30. If the usually where, it, you know, backwardation, I'm sorry, uh, contango, and that means the 90-day might be higher than the 30-day. So you might have the 30-day 30, the, uh, the being 25 and the, the long data being 30. And so between that 30-day and 90-day, you know it has to be the, the implied forward rate has to be higher than 25, even higher than 30. So to drag uh, in order for that 90-day to be valid at 30. So you, you might have a 32 or 33 or 34 forward volatility. Now, that's somewhat exciting, but then what we do is we we compare like that calculation of of the formulaic forward volatility to a time spread calculation. And it's a little bit too technical, I'll, I'll skip over it, but that relationship is usually pretty stable. But when the market gets in duress, when the market starts moving around a lot, that relationships gets out of whack and we can start to see that and that's one of the canaries in the coal mine that we use and i know it sounds pretty vague but uh, that and contango a lot of people use uh to see what's uh that something's coming up something's happening in the market so we're lucky as option uh, research uh people that we could see when when things are happening and we started to see that last month when we were on the show uh, and then I was on uh, volatility views and kind of said it's it's getting to concerned level. And then after that, it really got concerning. I think we said spicy since the spicy meatball was on. So it did get very spicy after that. So uh, what we're seeing now is is those indicators that indicate duress are turning and going the other way. Uh, including the the put call slope, which we'll talk about a little bit too. So the forward volatility relationships are starting to get more stable. The contango is starting to, the the backwardation has come out of it. So it's about flat now. So what we want to see for, if we're bullish the market, we want to see contango in there. So over zero. Uh, And then we want to see implied volatility start to fall. When, when you see those things, that, that means the market usually is uh, calming down and usually it's a, per, it's a bullish sign. Um, slope uh, can be tricky. Uh, that has a lot to do with supply and demand. But often when you get to a low, you'll get um, the puts implied versus the call implied. Uh, the puts usually are trading a lot higher than, than the uh, calls, especially in the ETFs. And then what will happen is when you reach a market bottom, then uh, the calls will start to get bid up. And that's what we're, we're seeing a little bit. So all those things, Mark, uh, you know, we had the duress. We saw the early signs last month, and now it seems to be calming down. So uh, everyone can take a big sigh of relief and uh, uh, because, uh, 
you know, the ORATS numbers are looking a little bit better, Mark. So in your own verbiage, sir, the market's a little bit less spicy these days than the last time you were with us, Matt. <laughs> yeah, that was fun with the meatball uh, <laughs> calling, calling for extra spice uh, on the way. Yeah, So it's like making an order uh, you know, at your, at your, of your Diablo pasta <laughs> and, and, um, the spice is coming, but now we're done with the spicy pasta. Mark. We're going, we're going on to dessert right now. Yeah. No more, maybe not ghost pepper wings anymore. Maybe more like your standard Buffalo now for a little while. We shall see. We shall see if the spice starts making its way back into the markets. Listeners, Rick, let's go out to you. Same question for you, but I have an addendum for you as well. So this is your first time joining us here in this mad, insane new year that is already off to a wild start in 2022. I want to start with you looking back a little bit. Obviously, 2021 was an insane year in a number of different categories. What stands out to you as some interesting highlights or lowlights from the options or volatility or indeed the advisor space as it pertains to this audience? And then afterwards, of course, we can get into your thoughts on what we're seeing out there right now in the market this month. Sure. Thank you. So uh, VIX, this index Sibo calculates, is um, looking at the expected 30-day volatility. And this is also known as the uh, fear gauge. Um, what we're seeing it, most recently is uh, VIX uh, has been climbing and uh, reached a 52-week high on the 24th of January, um, peaking at 38.94. And if you want to compare that to the average of 19.54, it's indicating that uh, there's plenty of fear in the market. Uh, you can see an inverse relationship between VIX and the S&P 500. So um, it's, it, you know, what you see is the bear sentiment has maybe reached a peak uh, near term, but it is certainly there. Not only in the S&P 500, we calculate a similar uh, volatility index on the Russell 2000. Uh, that peaked in December. It's currently around 45, or well, made a high of 45, and uh, uh, that average is about 27. Um, coincidentally, on the 24th, we saw a single daily record volume of over 63 million contracts, options contracts traded throughout uh, the 16 exchanges, and that compares to an average daily volume of 45. So if you want to look at a theme, um, we're seeing a lot more options trading activity uh, in 2021. It was up considerably, and we're seeing that continued in 2022. And I think you can tie the two, volatility and the opportunity to manage risk and uh, Trade volatility seems to be attracting a lot of attention these days. That it is, as we keep on rolling. It's part of that season, listeners. It's that time of year where we're seeing a lot of names pop off that are contributing to this wild volatility environment. So let's break it down. A little bit of the old earnings volatility reports. Earnings announcements can move markets. But what is the options market telling us about upcoming earnings events? Let's find out with the earnings volatility report. All right, everybody, welcome to the Earnings Volatility Report. You guys love Matt's data so much. Made a whole segment about it. Again, you guys can check out these reports for yourselves. Hot off the presses as of this morning over there, theoptionsinsider.com is the place to go uh, to learn more. Big names popping off this week. Big names like uh, Alphabet, EA, just seeing some more news. Looks like in the gaming sector coming off right now, all these Microsoft kicking off a buying spree with their deal of Activision. Sony's racing to buy other names. So hot news popping off this week as well. Qualcomm, Spotify, and the company formerly known as Facebook, now Meta, which I can't stand that name. On Wednesday, Thursday, we have Eli Lilly, Merck, Amazon, Ford. Ford lighting up the tape just about every day these days. Got a lot of meme stock characteristics to it, lighting it up this week on Thursday. Snap, Activision, Blizzard, Friday, a name you may be familiar with. Called the SIBO, popping off uh, before the bell there as well. Matt, it's been a wild start to the season. Week one, blowing the doors off 107%. Week two, I think, to put it charitably, pumping the brakes a little bit. We're seeing twice as many companies report and roughly half of the amount of vol we saw in week one. So catch us up. What have you been seeing out there? What's lighting up your tape in the world of earnings volatility right now, sir? Well, it, it, you know, the, it, this is similar to last uh, last season, uh, where we had a very 
uh, busy and a very uh, a lot of volatility in the first week. And then generally what, what we see is the first week isn't that busy. And then the second week gets a little bit uh, better for option holders. Third week is uh, even better. And fourth week is usually the best for option holders. Uh, the last two earnings season, the first week has been the best for, for uh, earning um, earning straddle holders. Uh, I think what happened too is is we got all that volatility uh, in the in coming into the market, and, and that really blew up a lot of the earnings moves that were implied. So it was a higher bar uh, that these companies had to get over, and they weren't getting over it. So you know we saw that you know that was kind of the the talk of of COVID, uh, you know, volatility was high and uh, the earnings weren't as important. Like last week, uh, you know, there were so many macro things going on that the, the individual name or earnings uh, weren't really popping off, as, as you say. So um, what I'm seeing is that, uh, you know, I, I think that we'll get a little bit of a spillover effect th this week because there's, uh, so, you know, there's quite a few macro things going. But I think it's going to, uh, you know, start again where the earnings matter, where people are starting to look at more of the fundamentals of individual companies rather than uh, kind of the overall macro events uh, in the uh, economy and affecting the market. And we'll start to see some of these names pop off a little bit more, meaning uh, the actual moves will be up to and, and maybe uh, equaling and going over uh, what's implied in the market. So uh, that's what we've seen so far. And as you say, this is a huge, like our earnings report are just pages long this, this week. And, uh, you know, so many companies, it's it's even hard to, to, to look through them. Of course, we uh, can sort through them and, and look, we, we put out these, uh, earnings trade reports that are fun to see because only a few companies really meet those criteria. Um, and as we talked about before, we're looking at uh, f focusing mostly, mostly on these uh, time spreads. They've worked the best in our back testing. And so, we, uh, you know, we could go down from hundreds of stocks just to four or five that we can uh, kind of isolate uh, in our uh, in our earnings season report. And Mark, I don't know if I've even talked to you about this. Maybe uh, briefly, we now are uh, putting our stock scanner out there uh, for alpha users. And one of the scans is the upcoming earnings this week. And then you could look at over or undervalued straddles and, and, a, and a bunch of other inf uh, bits of information. So uh, a lot going on at ORATS around earnings. And, uh, you know, uh, this earnings season is, is uh, interesting and I think about to become more interesting, Mark. Yeah, you're right. Speaking of interesting, you guys are just going crazy on the data front over there, Matt. You have so many different offerings now. You're right. I'm looking at the earnings trades report as we speak. Everyone's been waiting with bated breath for some uh, new earnings trades to come out. We got some listeners here looking at some long calendars in Robinhood. A lot of you have been asking about Robinhood lately, listeners. Uh, Matt and his team looking at some long calendars there. Juniper Networks as well as a few others. You got some interesting trade ideas. Looks like some long calendars, some long straddles, and a couple of short straddles as well, Matt. So you're you're kicking off the earnings trade season with a, a sampler of almost everything. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's just based purely on uh, on the numbers, what worked in the past uh, to indicate, uh, you know, larger moves. Obviously, it's very difficult to be long these uh, straddles. So, you know, we, we just uh, pick the cream of the crop uh, and, and uh, you know, gives gives people something to look at for educational purposes only, I should say, Mark. Very educational indeed. You guys can check out those reports for yourselves. Of course, theoptionsider.com. If you want to check out everything Matt was just talking about, including that cool stock scanner. I know a lot of the people in our in our live chat are the ideal, ideal alpha and beta testers of that kind of stuff. Check it out over there at ORATS, O-R-A-T-S dot com is the place to go. Meanwhile, it's time for us to go on into our next segment. It is time for Options 101. It's time to learn how to manage risk and generate additional income for your clients. It's time for Options 101. All right, everybody, welcome to Options 101, where we delve into an options strategy or trading technique or tip and explain how you can utilize it in your clients' portfolios. And today's Options 101, we know we went back to revisit the collar 
on our last show, you know, given your feedback and everything that's going on and talking uh, to Rick here ahead of the show, it seems like it's a worthwhile time to revisit that revisitation once again, because there's a lot of talk, a lot of questions, a lot of comments. A lot of people have callers on the brain right now. Remember, so if you want a deep dive into all things callers, go check out the archives of this program. We did a, a deep dive on it back on August. We kind of just went back into it again last episode as well, talked about some of our favorite or perhaps least favorite structures right now. These things get kind of dicey in the environments we were kind of hanging out in recently, not so much right now, of where the put skew is starting to get very, very bid out there. In fact, we have a question of the week about that right now. You guys can play along, give us your feedback right now. At Options is the place to go over there on Twitter, asking you effectively, what are your favorite strategies for these types of high skew environments? Gave you a variety of choices, long puts or put spreads or collars, short puts or put spreads, or bullish risk reversals, which is, of course, selling the put and buying the call. Put butterflies or ratios and then the infamous other. And right now, this just went live before showtime. Right now, 80% of you are looking to the dark side, saying you're selling puts or put spreads or bullish risk reversals, which is kind of what I expected, even though it looks like put butterflies and ratios are making a bit of a comeback. This just went live. You have the rest of the week to play along. So if you're listening after the fact, head on over to at options and make your voice heard. But Rick, I said we just talked about collars, but this is a, a topic we talk about frequently here on the show. In fact, I've called it in the past the holy grail options position for financial advisors because so many of them are coming to this show managing long equity accounts on behalf of their clients. They're looking to get some sort of protection, but they don't want to pay an arm and a leg for it. And that's kind of where the collar comes. I know you've been looking at a lot of different data, a lot of different research over there, Rick, when it comes to zero cost collar. So why don't you break it down a little bit for us? What are your thoughts on collars, maybe their suitability to this environment right now, and the old zero-cost collar, sir. Sure, thank you. So um, I think a lot of advisors are, are looking at, how do I protect my client's portfolio in a cost-effective manner? And one of the concerns is the cost. It's expensive. Insurance is expensive, especially if you're buying ex- insurance for downside price protection and volatility is screaming. So. Um, there's a number of collars, and one of uh, the collars that we're going to highlight today is the zero cost put spread collar. Now, SIBO calculates a variety of strategy benchmark indexes based on various underlying indexes. Uh, we have one on uh, the S&P 500, the Russell 2000, MSCI, et cetera. Um, so what I wanted to point out is each one of these strategy benchmark indexes has a ticker associated with it. So if you're interested, you can go to SIBO's website. You can type in SIBO.com forward slash CLLZ. And that will take you to the web page that will give you a description on the SIBO S&P 500 zero cost put spread collar. We have something similar for the Russell. CLLR. So same concept. So what is the CLLZ. The CLZ is designed to hedge against downward price movements on the S&P 500. You're buying a put spread, 2.5% out of the money. You're, you're buying a 2.5% out of the money put. You're selling a 5% out of the money put. And then you're selling a call to finance that put spread. So if you look at today, um, the S&P 500, roughly 44.83. The 2.5% put would be buying a 43.70 strike, selling the 42.60 strike, and then uh, cursory look, this would be uh, uh, probably selling a 46.25 call. Um, and of course, the uh, the term is defined by the advisor. How how long does uh, uh, does do you want that protection to be in place? Uh, and in this case, I was just looking at the Fab 18. Um, which is the standard AM settled um, option the third Friday of February. Um, the benchmark indexes are calculated using the third Friday expir- expiration, and it's updated every month, um, looking at where the two and a half and the five percent of the money put is. At the at the end of the expiration, um, 
for each month. So I wanted to to highlight um, how can this be used? And the, the case that I think is most interesting is when Mark Cuban decided to sell his company, Broadcast.com, to Yahoo. And this goes back to 1998. His company, Broadcast.com, was sold for $5.7 billion. And in return, Mark Cuban received 14.6 million shares of Yahoo, which at the time was trading at $95 a share. So his concentrated position had a market value of about $1.4 billion. In order to protect the value of his holdings, what he decided to do was put on a zero-cost put-spread collar, which allowed him to hold his position, locking in his share value during this lockup period. So in this case, what he did, he bought an 85-strike put. He sold a 205-strike call. And uh, he did this for zero. In fact, I, I misspoke. It was put spread. He just bought the put, sold the call out of the money call, and he was able to do this for zero cost. Now, during this time period, the the price of Yahoo did go up, and it went up above 200, but he held on to the, the color position, and it's possible to do that without being assigned. If you do this with flex options, you can uh, do a flex option European style, so it will not be uh, called away or signed, um, and I presume that's what he did in this case. Uh, subsequently, Yahoo uh, stock price did go down way below the $95, and he was able to protect his uh, his uh, holdings and, uh, and not have his position called away or, uh, um, or have to sell any, any part of it. So uh, this is a very effective strategy for uh, managing uh, risk of a concentrated stock position, as well as if you want to do this on a portfolio or uh, using an ETF, um, strategy applies across the board. I'm glad you brought that up, Rick, because you talked about collars many times here on the show, but somehow we've never talked about what is probably the most infamous example of a collar out there. I heard it many times back when I was on the floor of the SIBO. Oh, did you hear that? This Mark Cuban guy used a collar. And then, of course, we all know what happened to the high flyers of the dot-com bubble listeners, your Yahoos and your AOLs and everything else, all went straight down not too long after. And so having that put certainly uh, saved Mark Cuban's bacon. That deal, all that Yahoo stock would have been worth a lot less (laughs) if he hadn't done that. So that's always been one of the more infamous examples that's bandied about. That allowed him to do all the other crazy things he's done since then by the Mavericks. Do his uh, Shark Tank. He wouldn't have had much money to put to work in Shark Tank if he hadn't gone along and done that college. Let's start there, Mr. Matt. I'm curious. You've been around the SIBO back in the day as well. I'm sure you've heard this story many times. What are your thoughts on the infamous uh, Mark Cuban collar? There was also a Microsoft collar that went up big. Uh, I had guys, I, I backed guys in the SIBO back then and traded. And, uh, you know, what, what would happen is they'd start putting it on. And you'd have the position, and, and then they'd move the price, and move the price, and move the price. So you, you know, you had to hold on for a long time, and it was it, it got pretty painful. Let's just put it that way. Um, and yeah, my comment on, on on callers is the the way that I like to to look at it is, um, I like to look at the calls separately from the puts. Now I know some some people it's a little bit more difficult to explain, but there are different. Uh, you know, when we're doing back testing, there are different days to expiration um, and different prices that that tend to to work better uh, for for different stocks and and uh, different types of stocks. So we, you know, a lot of our back testing, we've done some huge uh, three million uh, back tests on on a group of stocks, for example, that's up on our blog, blog.orets.com, and. You know, we show like some of the rules uh, that have worked well, like uh, avoiding earnings, like uh, try to get a high uh, spread yield, like uh, 30 days is usually good. And then we, on the converse, you know, when we're when we're uh, buying puts, you know, those are uh, there are times and 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 back tests that we like to look at. You know, often you know a very long term one might be good or 
um, you know, again, doing a time spread if you're, if you're uh, allowed to or a put spread caller, uh, like was mentioned. So, uh, you know, the, the way I like to look at it is just if you can uh, and you have a slightly more sophisticated user of it is to try to separate those and uh, back test, optimize, uh, take a look at, at, at those and, and go over the payoff pictures and et cetera with the uh, individuals and then go from there, Mark. So that's how I like to do it. And normally I like to save the listener questions till the end, but I'm going to cheat because we have so many that are just immediately, <laughs> immediately relevant to this segment here. Let's go to this one first from Tom S. He says, hello, Mark and crew. Big fan of the advisors option. Not sure why others haven't jumped into the world of advisors and options as it is an underserved market. Shh, don't tell anybody, Tom. This is this is only for us here to play in the advisors and options waters here. Uh, he goes on to write, so glad to hear your episodes last month and in August about collars. I've been experimenting with spy protective puts in some client accounts, and so far the results have not been encouraging. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Because I've heard your admonitions about spending outrageous amounts of premium on your out-of-the-money put hedge, and that seems to be the case. My question is, why do these puts remain so expensive if they are so difficult to make pay off? Who keeps bidding these things up? <laughs> and what do you recommend for sources of protection right now? He puts in parentheses, oh, obviously he's a listener. He says, outside of Matt's dubious cheap puts, <laughs> that's a little too advanced for me right now. Yeah, we talked about that on the most recent episode as well, listeners. Check out that if you want a little bit more uh, detail. And we have a related question. He mentions August. Let me just bring this one up. We talked about on August episode as well. This one came in from MTL35. He says, I very much enjoy your advisor's option program. I listened to the entire archive now, and it has improved my client approach to derivatives tremendously. Thank you for your assistance. It is invaluable. Well, you're welcome there. He goes on to say, I also have a question if you have the time on your program. Where do we currently stand on the collar strategy? I agree with the host that collars can be the quote, holy grail for financial advisors. However, the current and he puts it in caps, extreme bid to the other money index puts makes executing such a strategy difficult to prohibitive in the current market environment. You're stuck getting not much protection or giving up too much upside to make the two legs offset each other. Am I missing something? Is there a better way to approach collars in these high valuation markets? And that's not enough. We have one here from Neats, Neats with a Z, says, is it even really viable to do index collars anymore? Or are the call premiums versus puts so skewed that it is practically impossible to get realistic price level? So three for questions here, Rick. Let's start with you on the efficacy of collars right now, because as they point out, not so much this second, but we have seen in recent weeks and months, the levels of put volatility in particular get extremely expensive. And that, as we know, can be prohibitive to doing collars. So Rick, we're getting a lot of questions about the efficacy of collars in those high type of skew environments. What would you say here for our listeners, Tom S, MTL 35 and Neats, sir? Right. So uh, like any other insurance product, um, the best time to buy insurance is when uh, volatility is low. Um, looking at a hedge when, vol when VIX is at, you know, uh, Above its average, 19.54, close to 40. Uh, obviously, the uh, put skew is going to be pumped up, and uh, the cost for protection is also going to be increased. So, um, looking at various ways to put on a hedge, buying a put is going to be prohibitive. Premiums are too high. Uh, putting on a a zero cost put spread collar makes a lot of sense. Um, question is for what time period um, and and so I think this is where it becomes uh, as much of an art as it is a science looking at the the right strikes to optimize the uh, the hedge and the cost uh, perhaps this is where ORAT comes into play um, you, in case of SIBO strategy benchmark index it's fairly formulaic you buy the two and a half percent you Put you sell the five percent and then you're selling an out of the money call, collecting the premium from the call to, to offset the cost, the debit of the put spread. Uh, so, using that concept, um, it can be applied to equities, and it's uh, it's it, it's a matter of going through the machinations and uh, finding out the right strikes uh, to meet the the cost and the the amount of protection you're looking for. Uh, over what, whatever time period, and, and I, I'd like to point out that this is um, this concept has been used 
for the buffer protect um, indexes. And you can see the popularity in these uh, indexes uh, because of the ETFs that have uh, flourished uh, using SIBO's buffer protect uh, approach, it's similar to zero cost. They're using the uh, premium collected on the call to finance the the buffer protection on the on the downside. Um, so again, you know, this can be applied to equities, ETFs, or indexes. Mr. Matt, same question for you here. What do you have to say for Tom S. MTL thirty five and Neats? I do like I do like uh, Tom S. You can tell he's a listener because he also mentioned that your what would you call him your dubious puts idea was a little bit too advanced for him, sir. But what do you have to say here for the rest of the folks, sir? Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree that you want to be buying these when the vol is low, but there's still things to do when the, when the volatility gets higher. So, um, uh, you know, a, a couple of uh, uh, of things that I that I do personally. Now, if you're allowed to sell and you're allowed to do temp, some type of a uh, a put spread. For example, I still like the the longer term way out of the money puts, and you could then um, you know find some way out of the money, uh, you know slightly uh, maybe farther out of the money that you could sell against it. Um, so you're what you're doing then is you're you're uh, p- selling an option and buying another one, and then if you have a scanner like we have, we could we could find the ones that we think have a relative value that look good. And so there's, there's a lot of things that you have to do, get a little bit more creative, but you could definitely still get some protection out there. That's the important thing. If you're, um, you know, if you're looking for protection and the volatility is high, you got to get a little bit more creative um, because you, you're, you're right. You can get um, thumped pretty good if the volatility comes in. Um, another way to do it is if you look at the payoff picture of a calendar, and a way out of the money calendar. So the calendars make money when you go towards that uh, calendar strike. So I'm I'm looking at a scan in, in our option scanner. Um, the stock's about uh, spies about 450, and you're looking at about 430, 420, something like that. As the stock goes down to those prices, that's when the the calendars are worth the most. So you can uh, buy a calendar, which you know you could buy a uh, a May and sell a, a Feb or or something along those lines where you have a, a few months in, in between there. And as the stock drifts down, um, that's a, a a good strategy for that type of a, of a move. Now, if the if the market's screaming and it goes through your price, uh, you know, you're not going to get the protection. But, um, but, you know, if you have enough of these put calendars, though, um, you know, they, they uh, can pay off and, and you just have to be kind of ready to take them off as the stock uh, goes down and approaches your strikes. Um, so, you know, those are a couple of things. Another thing, it, it, you know, I, as I'm owning these uh, puts and the volatility went way up, you know, I, I, I found a couple that were expensive and, and you know, sold, sold some of those. So let's say if I hold 10, I maybe sold two or three and get a ton of premium. And, you know, as the market kind of rallies back up, those things get destroyed and my uh, the my way out of the money puts still kind of hold their value, even though the Vegas coming in a bit, it's going to go down a little bit, but not as bad as as though. So you have to get a little bit more creative, Mark, when the volatility is high. There's no way to get around it, I don't think. And uh, but you can do some calendars, you can do some verticals um, and you can do some, I guess, what the last thing I mentioned was a. A, a diagonal, uh, you know, with a bit of a ratio, uh, but you know, it's a little bit more complicated. But um, you know, try to fi- figure out, um, you know, some other strategies that you might want to do when, you know, the volatility is higher than than normal. Mark. All right, well said, sir. Our second tilt at the collar windmill, and as as money months, given your your feedback and your questions, I have a feeling it's not going to be the last time we're going to talk about collars. It'll probably be popping up on our radar again soon, though. Meanwhile, it's time for us to keep on rolling. It is time to get the buzz. Busy financial advisors don't have time to follow the latest developments from the options market, so we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All 
All right, everybody, welcome to The Buzz, where we break down some of the big stories in the world of options and derivatives that you may have missed since our last episode. And we do finally have the official numbers for the mad, insane year that was 2021. Remember on our last episode, listeners, we were speculating, we thought, we knew about a ballpark of where we were going to go out for the year. But, you know, the question we had on our lips to start the year last year, and a lot of people were asking us throughout the year was, can this insane explosive options volume party, can this thing continue? Obviously, we kicked off the year hot and heavy with the meme stock explosion. Vol was racing towards the 40 handle last January. Sounds kind of reminiscent of, of this January as well when you think about it. But then, of course, the question remained, could we keep seeing these records? And the answer of usually month after month was yes. Most months we came across was the most active, whatever it was, February, March, April, in the history of the options business. And oftentimes, they were also the most active month ever in the history of the options business. So if you look at the top five months options history, most of them, if not all of them, were last year, listeners. So in a crazy year, now we finally have the official numbers from our friends over there at OCC. And yes, we did blow the doors off. We were threatening $10 billion to go out the year, listeners, which... Of course, we were already talking about 2020 being an insane year. That was 7.52 billion contracts on the tape, listeners, at the end of 2020. And a lot of people didn't think we'd hit that level anytime soon, given what we're seeing in the market. But we blew the doors off in 2020. And 2021, like I said, just even more aggressive. We, you knew how crazy of a year it was, listeners, when we surpassed that 7.5 billion level by mid-October. We had already beaten that. By mid-October, the rest of the year was just gravy. And so closing in on 10 billion, 9.93 billion options contracts changing hands. Let's just say derivatives contracts. OCC also clears some futures and a few other things. If you want to get pure options, it is 9.87 billion contracts. That's billion with a B, listeners. A 32% increase over the previous year. I'll just give you some numbers really quickly. Then I'll go around the horn and get everyone's thoughts on the mad, insane year that was 2021. Like I mentioned, overall volume, a 9.87 billion options contracts. We drill down a little bit further. Equity options, 9.36 billion. It's up 33.7%. That includes ETF options. If you pull those out, that was about 2.7 billion. It's up about 5.1%. So ETF options have been one of the few laggards out there. Total index volume was 503 million contracts. That's up 8.8% compared to 2020. So again, insane. We're talking also getting to the point where we're almost hitting about a billion contracts a month. So if we stay on that pace, and again, we don't know the numbers for January yet. They'll be coming out tomorrow. I'll be have I'll have a nice uh, re-release from our friends over there at OCC in our hot little hands. But if we're staying on that roughly close to 1 billion contracts a month pace, uh, then we expect 2022 to be even more tumultuous uh, from an options volume perspective. Rick, we'll start with you. When you're not talking to me on a show like this. You spend your days over there at the exchange. So you're knee deep in what's going on from a volume perspective. First off, let me get your overall thoughts on just were you in the camp that thought we could beat 2020 last year? Or were you like me? I'll admit it. I was pretty skeptical coming into last year. I did not think we could eclipse that seven and a half billion level, just seeing everything that it took from a global macroeconomic perspective to hit that number in 2020. I didn't think it was possible. I was proven wrong. I'm curious, were you skeptical like I was at the beginning of the year? And what were your thoughts as we not just beat it, but dramatically surpassed it towards the end of the year, Rick? You know, I, I said at the top of this uh, podcast, that I'm old school. I mean, I was on the trading floor when you had open outcry. Uh, What's changed in the, in the marketplace is just amazing to me. You've got um, the, the democratization of the market. Uh, you've got individuals who are following social media uh, messages in Reddit and other locations and, and getting trading ideas. And uh, you have the ability to trade on your cell phone. Um, you've got uh, the Robin Hoods of, of the world that make it real easy for individuals to uh, come up with an idea and trade on it. Um, you know, when you see the increase in volume of 32% year over year, the majority of that is in the in individual names, the single names, focusing on 
some of the meme stocks, AMC, GameStop, et cetera. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of surprised on one hand that the, uh, the increase is as dramatic as it was, but I'm not surprised that it was increased, period. Um, options have really been um, adopted by uh, the, the masses as a way to express a view in the market. It's a very cost-effective way to uh, express a long or short view, and uh, it's also a wonderful way to uh, manage risk. So I, I think this creates kind of a platform for much further growth down the road, and so I'm encouraged by it. Um, another interesting thing I'd like to point out is that the, the volume is not simply coming from Generation X. Um, I've got a friend who has a, a big following um, in, in, in his commentary and he's telling me that uh, a lot of his followers are 55 to 70 year olds who have time on their hands and want to you know trade options. So uh, Mark, this is, uh, this is a new era. That it is, yes. Uh, many new players joining the world of options. Many new listeners listening to shows on the network. So it has been fun to see just the uh, the overall growth in all things options over the past couple of years. Matt, I've been chatting with you just about every month out here over the course of the past year. So I know you weren't perhaps quite as skeptical as I was kicking off the year about the volume numbers. But I think I don't know if any of us had a nearly 10 billion handle to round out the year. So what were your thoughts on these just I think the technical term is insane numbers that we're seeing in the world of options and corollary to that do you think we could uh, we could rival that again next year so my my thesis is that uh, track the fed and the more money that they have sloshing around uh, the more it finally gets into options and so um you know i think this year you know if the fed does uh, close the spigot a little bit i think we're not going to have uh, the near the record so i'm going to go on I'm going to go on a record saying that we're not going to get the the record this uh, next year, which is a tough position to uh, defend. I, um, and you know, uh, I, I was reading an article that uh, the the public has discovered puts, um, and uh, it appears that these uh, retail investors and the ones that are that are trading small lots like ten or less spent a record amount of money establishing new bearish position, positions. Um, as you know, Mark, I, I like to look at the the five delta uh, uh, implied volatility versus the 75 delta uh, and look at the component weighted. So what we do is we uh, average all the components of the underlying ETFs. And uh, that ha- that held for a very long time. So that uh, that ratio got above one, which is which, which is quite incredible. Uh, meaning the, the the five delta implied volatility was above the seventy five delta those seventy five delta calls. So those are actually twenty five delta puts. So that's pretty that's pretty incredible. It has since come down, and I think uh, as this article that I was I was looking at has noted that the that the small lots uh, people uh, they're getting tired of buying the dip, and they're buying puts now. So. Um, you know, what we've seen is, as I, I agree, uh, there has been an incredible uh, small lot participation in this uh, in options. And, um, you know, we're seeing it now go from the, the calls to now they're uh, bringing down the, the skew to recognizable levels, Mark. BTFD fatigue finally hitting the market out there. Is it possible? I don't know. We were joking about it on our last episode, back on Monday, last Monday's episode, where we said, hey, what happened to the BTFD crowd? No sooner did we say that than every major index completely reversed and wiped out all their losses for the day. So they were obviously listening to the show last Monday, and they dove in pretty hard. But interesting to what you're saying about the, the skew there, Matt. That's certainly one to watch. I, of course, was on record being very cynical last year. I was happy to be proven wrong out there of course the options volume so i don't know maybe i've had some of the cynic beaten out of me now because it does seem like this new audience that has come is here to stay for a while and they are putting up some numbers out there it's not like the usual flash in the pan crowd we've seen they've been around for a while now and they're still remaining pretty active i'm with you that the you know the fed has been rising tide that lifted all boats out there for a while and of course a nice bull market is usually 
nice to options traders. They like that kind of thing. It'd be interesting to see how they fear with a little bit more choppy, more turbulent market. But still, I'm, I'm not quite prepared to say that uh, we can't hit those levels again. I guess we'll know for sure. Once, once January will be a bit of the bellwether for us, we'll know for sure when those numbers come out tomorrow uh, from OCC, how we're trending for the year. Speaking of numbers, Rick, I know when you're not talking with me here on a show like this, you guys over there at SIBO and your research team putting out a lot of research that will interest particularly a lot of the audience for this program, the advisors and asset managers out there who are looking for interesting new ways to perhaps enhance yield or generate premiums or returns or protection for their clients. Give us a quick rundown of some of the more interesting stuff you guys are working on out there, Rick. Thank you. SIBO well, does uh, commission white papers. We commissioned a white paper from Wilshire Associates. Um, they looked at the performance of selected option writing strategies used to reduce risk and enhance income. Um, these are based on the uh, S&P 530 Delta buy right, uh, put right, the Russell 2000 put right, MSCI put right, MSCI emerging uh, put right, et cetera. So um, that was uh, uh, last year. And we also commissioned a paper from EQD um, focusing on uh, case studies, um, how options on the mini Russell 2000 can be used to uh, generate income and uh, manage downside risk. Um, both papers are available. Um, if you want to come directly to me, feel free, Rosenthal at SIBO.com, or you can go to SIBO's uh, website and uh, uh, go under uh, education. In addition to that, we have a series of uh, webinars. Um, they're available at no cost. You just simply have to register. There's one coming up uh, tomorrow, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, Option Fundamentals, The Greeks with Shelley Natenberg. And then on the 9th at 12 Eastern, uh, 22 option strategies in 2022 with uh, Sean Howell from uh, E-Trade and Tim Withers from uh, Tip, uh, Withers Analytical Consulting. Um, so we're uh, very interested in uh, supporting and providing um, you know, education, research, and we have a variety of tools on our web website, uh, uh, which can be used for uh, trade optimization, uh, calculations, um, et cetera. So I encourage you to just go to SIBO.com, uh, uh, navigate a little bit, and uh, if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to me. All right, everybody. That music means an hour flies by when we're talking advisors and options. But before we go, Mr. Matt, we're just talking about all the fun, interesting tools you have over there in the land of ORATS, including this cool new uh, scanning tool. I want to check that out myself. If our audience over there wants to check it out for themselves, where should they go? What should they do, Mr. Matt? Yeah, Mark, we should get together and get some uh, some alpha testers from the Option Insider. I your, think we got some team. willing participants here, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's been great. So, yeah, you know, a, a lot of what I want to tie in um, to ORATS is is more uh, of the information where we could screen down stocks and get, you know, a lot, a lot of our users, especially uh, the advisors are looking for certain types of stocks, high PE, low PE, uh, you know, and, and having strategies based on those. So we've we've made the stock scanner where you can uh, literally use hundreds uh, and there, we could make up ratio. So it's an infinite number of of fundamental implied volatility, historical volatility, earnings related information, dividends related information, forecasts, and then uh, narrow down, you know, this huge list of now we have over 5,500 uh, symbols that trade options, and then send them over to the option scanner. And the option scanner has hundreds of different uh, strategies that you could apply and then look at, you know, we have, uh, you know, payoff pictures, we have uh, you could filter down on all the Greeks. You can uh, filter on open interest. Fil just a, you know, just a ton of things. So you could get really down to the uh, strategy that you're looking for using the, these scanners. And it's really nice to streamline. Uh, people have said we're saving them a lot of time now. So uh, we've got that. And then on the horizon here, uh, over the next month, we're going to have a whole fundamentals page so you'll be able to find out all the information uh historical uh 
uh, earnings information, historical implied volatility, et cetera. So it's it's a, a plethora of things coming, Mark. And so we're, we're excited to be here. Email me at Matt at ORATS if you want to uh, uh, alpha test or just go to ORATS.com and uh, and get yourself a, a reduced fee trial and get in and, and start checking the stuff out. Check it out. ORATS.com, O-R-A-T-S.com is the place to go. Give them a follow on the old Twitters as well, at Option Rats, one of the more memorable handles. out. He's always tweeting out something interesting about a particular back test or analysis or something you probably didn't consider about the world of options. Of course, you can always check out all those reports we talked about at the top of the show. Earnings move, earnings move results, earnings season, and now the newly minted earnings trades reports over there at the Options Insider Dot com. And of course, you know to go to check out the latest from our friends over there. The OIC options education dot org is the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. Check out their advisor section over there as well. A lot of great data and research that you can utilize and arm yourself with when you sit down with your clients. Want to explain maybe why they should consider implementing options in their portfolios. A lot of great data for you over there. Options education dot org is the place to go. We have to go on out of here, but of course, we'll be back again tomorrow. All of you out there in the Secret Club will get to join us for our next pro Q&A session. Should be a good one. Jim Carson joining us from Kai Volatility Advisors. I have a feeling a lot of you have questions about volatility, but we'll be answering those tomorrow. Of course, back again on Wednesday, Education Wednesday, Options Bootcamp, Options Playbook Radio. Don't need me to tell you about those. Those shows burning up the charts these days. Of course, back on Thursday, this week in Futures Options, with our friends over there at CME and FTSE Russell, as well as the Option Block, your bi-weekly dose of all things active options trading out there. Friday volatility views. And, of course, for you Secret Club folks, we have Options Oddities. Then back again next week and all the way through to next month. Wait a whole other month, but we'll get there, listeners. Trust me. And the next episode of the Advisor's Option. We'll see you then. Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop options strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.